Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, India. It's now the world's fastest growing major economy. It's even a beneficiary of the collapsing price of oil. But although India's economic growth looks good, the living standards for most are not improving, and large parts of the economy could actually be slowing. We'll look at the latest budget, but also why India still struggles to unleash its full potential. Also this week, how Lego built itself into the biggest toy maker on the planet. We talked to the CEO about its latest product releases, and also about how turning a basic plastic brick into an iconic brand helps it weather the economic storms. I'm Adrian Brown in Shanghai, symbol of China's economic might. But the economy's in trouble, so can consumers help. So we're looking at India this week, the world's biggest democracy, its second most populous country, and an economy which has raced ahead of China as the world's fastest growing. But a growth rate of 7.3%, whilst a fantastic headline figure, doesn't tell the whole story. So that's what we're going to attempt to tell. This past week, a new budget was unveiled, and business people were looking for, let's say, a bit of a hand from their government, a government which had promised them so much. Vanu Bhatnago starts us off from New Delhi. For the first time in 25 years, Rajesh Prasad's business is losing money. He manufactures roofing materials for industrial buildings and voted for Modi in 2014. He had great hopes for the Indian economy, as did millions of other small business owners. They hoped things would be better than under the previous administration, badly undermined by allegations of corruption. With the Modi government coming in after that, at, at least he built up that positive sentiment. Today, say after almost like it's more two years, Right now, uh, we are into crisis. Modi swept to power on a wave of hope for change. On paper, the economy is doing well. Cheap oil has been an unexpected blessing. But many export markets are now slowing. What people don't realize that India is also an oil exporting country. One third of the oil imports which we import, we export as finished product. Our biggest trade destination is Dubai. $110 billion goes to Dubai, and Dubai is contracting. Saudi Arabia is contracting. Everybody is contracting. So where are you going to get growth? India has never had a prime minister quite like Modi. He's unusual in having risen to the top from a humble background. And he says he's accomplished a great deal since coming to office, like signing multi-billion dollar foreign investment deals and making it easier to start a business. But many here in India feel his personality and policies are proving divisive. There's growing discontent from several sections of society that say the government isn't listening to the underprivileged. But Modi can rely on support from the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, or RSS, a right-wing organization that is an ideological mentor to the ruling BJP. Uh, there is a coalition of the intelligentsia, wh which are pro-Islamic intelligentsia too, and pseudo-secular forces. So they are the people who are protesting Narendra Modi and trying to divert the attention from the genuine work being done by this government. Back at the factory, Rajesh doesn't know how long he can sustain his business without new tax breaks or other help from the government. He has faith in Modi, but faith alone may not be enough. So the likes of Rajesh, who we saw in that report, were looking for something in the new budget to reward that faith. In the end, though, it was the agricultural sector which got the most attention. Here is India's Finance Minister Arun Jaitley speaking about his pledge to double the incomes of around 120 million farmers over the next five years. We need to think beyond food security and give back to our farmers a sense of income security. Government will therefore reorient its interventions in the farm and non-farm sector to double the income of farmers by 2022. Our total allocation on agriculture and farmers' welfare is rupees 35,984 crores. So let's discuss the real effects of such a budget. Prableen Bajpai is joining us from New Delhi. She's the founder and CEO of FinFix, uh, a research and analytics business. Prableen, I understand you go by the name Nikki most days, so I'll actually call you that. Nikki, this budget was supposed to be a, a so-called budget of the poor, and, and I think Narendra Modi is seen as a bit more of a man who's open to the various classes in India. Do you think the budget actually lived up to some of those expectations? 
The budget, uh, as the government is describing it, it's called Vikas ka budget. Now, Vikas is a Hindi word which means growth and development. So, I won't say that it's purely a pro pro uh, poor uh, budget for the poor only. It's a budget uh, which has a long term view, vision, uh, rather than something uh, which would just spur the economy in the short term. Uh, yes, there has been a lot of allocation and uh, there is a lot of focus on the rural sector as well as farmers getting to uh, giving a boost to the, let's say, agrarian uh, agrarian uh, economy, which India, uh, which is considered actually as the backbone of the Indian economy uh, in the previous times. So uh, with this budget, we will see uh, what the government is trying to do is strengthen the base uh, if we take it as a pyramid, so what they are trying to focus it uh, focuses on the base of this pyramid, which is uh, the rural sector in India. So if uh, there is better income, there is better employment, there is better development, at the base, everything would eventually uh, percolate into the entire economy. Do you think that broadly speaking, India can uh, maintain its growth levels? It's obviously been doing very well. I believe um, 7.8 is the forecast for this year for um, GDP, but but they will be having to manage that, won't they, so that there aren't any great falls which it can't control. You know, I guess I'm thinking about China here, um, the way it has gone, the way it has tried to manage that sort of slowdown. Do you think India has the right level of control over its slowdown? Uh, China, yes, uh, they've reported uh, their uh, slowest growth in 25 years. Uh, India, I would say, uh, the problem with Indian economy. Uh, right now is that we have uh, it growing at three different speeds. So at the top speed we have e-commerce, hotels, restaurants, uh, urban consumer goods industries which are growing very fast. Then we have these sectors, let's say steel, iron ore, aluminium, which are doing moderately okay, not great. And then we have this uh, third uh, sector, which is our rural sector, which is actually kind of pulling back the economy. And uh, this has been the main focus of this current budget. So uh, a focus on this third sector, which is languishing, would surely help uh, the Indian economy maintain its uh, sustainable growth rate at, say, uh, the budget is, of course, uh, uh, taking it as 8 to 10. Uh, but I surely see it as 7 to 8 percent. Yes, it's sustainable. All right, Nikki Bajpai with her thoughts on India's economy right now. Thanks for that, Nikki. Now, seeing as we mentioned China there, we thought we'd check in with the state of its economy too. The annual National People's Congress gets underway this week, charged with setting the country's next five-year economic plan. And with things still slowing, the government's now pinning its hopes for recovery on consumer spending. More on that from Adrian Brown in Shanghai. China's government thinks it has a saviour for its sagging economy, the consumer. But the mood seems cautious in Shanghai's Nanjing Road, the country's most famous shopping district. I will be very careful with my consumption. I will still spend the money, but according to my needs. In many ways, these stores are just giant adverts because China's growing middle class are increasingly buying online what they see displayed in shop windows. I will try clothes for the right size at shopping malls and then buy it online because it's the same brand, same products, but cheaper. Now you can buy everything online. I don't bother going to real stores to shop. Shopping habits are changing. Katie Lee sells cosmetics via one of China's big online shopping platforms. Operating costs are low since her apartment serves as both office and warehouse. She buys in bulk at a discounted rate, ensuring prices are half those of traditional retailers. It's this kind of consumption that China's government wants to see more of. Online shopping is really good very different from traditional shopping. It's convenient, much cheaper, and you have a guaranteed return policy. So I think online shopping will only become more popular. Traditionally, manufacturing and exports have been the main drivers of China's economy, but that model has now run its course. Consumer spending is actually not that high in China. In the United States, it accounts for about 70% of the economy. Here in China, it's around 30%. Chinese people tend to be big savers. For the economy to pick up, the government needs that to change.
Our view is that consumption will be very stable um, over the medium to long term in China. And the main reason for that is that China has this incredibly high savings rate. So in China, the savings rate last year was around 49% of GDP. But unless those savings are unlocked, the flashing lights on Shanghai's famous waterfront could turn into warning signs. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, a chat with the boss of Lamborghini as he prepares to leave the company. His parting gift is a brand new limited edition supercar. We'll talk about just who's buying those types of big ticket items a little later in the program. Right now, though, the kind of toy which a few more of us can afford, Lego. In terms of sales, Lego has just cemented its position as the world's biggest toy maker. Its full year revenue grew 25% last year, helped in large part by the popularity of its Star Wars themed sets. Though personally, I have to say I'm a purist, just plain blocks for me. I want you to look at these numbers though, because they are quite extraordinary. Every second, seven new boxes of Lego are sold. Think about that, seven a second. For every person in the world, there are 62 Lego pieces. So that's what, oh, 434 billion pieces and growing. And Lego people, the little minifigures as they're known, actually outnumber real people in the world. So don't be surprised if they rise up and take over one day. Well, I'm joined now from the home of Lego, that is Billund in Denmark, by Jorgen Vignutstorp, who is the CEO of the Lego Group. It is lovely to have you on Counting the Cost again. You are the world's biggest toy maker. Is it that fact and the simplicity, if you like, of what you create, which keeps you out of trouble during any times of, of economic uh, downturn? I think we are in a position of strength and in a pretty good position. It's also because when I look at the company through more than 80 years, I see that uh, we are, uh, of course, correlated to the growth in the world economy on such a long stretch. But when I look at it in a, in a five or 10 year perspective, uh, we are not that impacted by how the uh, world economy is developing because it's really uh, more about the strength of the Lego product, how well it's performing, how it's irresistible and irreplaceable to children all over the world that really impacts uh, our opportunity gro to grow even in an economic downturn. Oh, so, so are you just basically saying that it's because you're Lego? Other toys go in and out of fashion, but Lego doesn't. At least Lego has managed with the core Lego brick experience to stay relevant through generations now. And then of course our job is how do we make it thematically relevant? What are the exciting things that children now can do uh, with Lego bricks? And how can we engage children through digital media and digital play experiences that combine and integrate with the physical play in interesting ways? Okay, um, thematically relevant you said there. To me that brings two words to mind, Star and Wars. <laughs> Uh, that must have been a huge kick for you, the movie coming out and then yes. another one's to come. Absolutely. It's a phenomenal news for us and we loved uh, the movie. We thought it was really revitalizing the Star Wars franchise. But I think also it's fair to say that in the years between the movies, Lego has really been a very important experience that kept Star Wars alive in the minds of many children. I hear so often that children get first introduced to Star Wars through Lego Star Wars. And so for us, uh, we feel it's always been important. We've been uh, working with Star Wars since 1999. Mm. And so, of course, now uh, the very successful return of the movies uh, is very good news for us and something that we were very excited about. So, so then is it, well, what are effectively joint ventures like that? Is that the way that you will, as you wish to do, and you've stated this, quadruple sales in less than a decade? Because that is a, a very tall order. Yes. Uh, I think uh, what's important to say about that is that still the majority of the Lego portfolio, more than 60%, and also the majority of the growth we're realizing is coming from Lego's own launch of products and new innovations, which of course also now includes aspects such as the Lego Movie, Lego Ninjago, and now this year Lego Nexo Nights, which also has a TV series. So uh, we are driving the growth on our own expense and account, if you like. And then we are very selective in certain partnerships with partners such as Disney that now has uh, Star Wars, uh, Marvel heroes, and also uh, Pixar movies such as uh, Frozen, which have been very mm. important properties for us to associate with. But we have to be quite careful here because there are so many properties, so many movies being launched all the time, and it's all about the Lego brick at the end of the day. So it's a careful uh, balance, and we're very, very selective in what 
what partners we work with. Yes, Frozen, very familiar with that one as I have a daughter. Um, let's just be geographical for a moment. I'm wondering where your strength lies in the world or is it just you know all over the world? I think about the downturn in China, Europe's still recovering as well. What sort of effects are these slowdowns having on the BRIC? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, what's interesting is that it, it appears that the Lego idea is appealing everywhere in the world. Uh, and so at least when I look at last year, we saw very strong growth in North America and also in Europe, but even higher growth in places like Brazil, uh, China, Japan. So clearly there are markets where we still have a lot of children we need to reach that we are currently not engaging with. And those are the markets where we have the highest growth potential and the longest uh, growth potential. And China is, of course, the jewel in the crown right mm. there for us. Uh, but uh, I think we are one of these companies that are also managing to book very significant and impressive organic growth even in our well-established markets as long as we can continue to innovate on the basis of the brick. Good recent example from the last three to four years is our introduction of themes more relevant for girls, bringing even more girls into the Lego portfolio of products. Just finally, Jochen, for all the positive talk we've had in this interview, our viewers may not know that Lego is actually something of a, a turnaround story. You know, things weren't going well in the late 1990s, the early 2000s, and the company was eventually turned around. Now, what did you learn from that that you can apply now to keep the business profitable and to keep the business growing? Yeah, I think the main lesson for us is to be very stubbornly almost uh, focused on a core product idea, this idea of putting bricks together and having them act as if they were glued and yet they are easy to take apart. It's an incredibly simple uh, business idea, but by staying very focused on that one, we can then uh, introduce complexity in terms of the number of countries we cover. So very narrow product focus, very clear brand proposition, really focusing on where we have unique strengths and are globally competitive but then expanding uh, globally and leveraging digital technology in a very skillful way. Those would be uh, the main lessons from us coming out of that turnaround situation. Jorgen Vignudstop from, well, Legoland actually. Great talking to you. Thank you for your time. Now, what about one of these? One of the world's most expensive supercars, which was recently unveiled at the Geneva Motor Show. It is a Lamborghini. It is called the Centenario to celebrate 100 years since the birth of the company's founder. Only 40 of them being built and they cost around oh, two million dollars or so. Well, we've got the CEO of Lamborghini with us from the Geneva Motor Show this week to talk about that and the luxury car business in general. It's Stefan Winkelmann. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Counting the Cost. I just want to ask you about the Centenario. As I said, 40 of them, um, $1.9 million each or thereabouts. Um, who buys that? And are you just going to sell all of those easily? They are all sold and uh Let's say they are equally distributed. We have a lot uh, in North America, we have uh, some in Europe, we have uh, the Middle East covered and also uh, the Asian side of this world. So they are pretty much well balanced uh, in terms of the sales, 20 coupes and 20, and 20 roadsters. Unbelievable. Um, uh, let's talk more about the more budget versions, if I can call it that, what you more commonly sell at Lamborghini. Um, how have your sales gone in a market where no, I sometimes wonder if luxuries would sort of start to go out the window a little bit when times are tougher economically. Yes, um, for the time being, on a worldwide base, uh, we are looking good. The two months, January and February, they are a bit above the level of last year. We have a solid order bank, but now to make a, a forecast for the year 16 as a whole is a bit difficult. Mm. And uh, if, if it stays like it is, I think that we will be on the same level as last year. Okay. Tell me more about doing business in these conditions then, because, you know, I speak to a lot of economists and a lot of academics, but I always think it's, it's good to talk to business people themselves uh, and find out how difficult or not difficult they find it, I guess, and what adjustments they have to make to counter these uh, economic conditions. But let's say that in general, what we, what we have to look into is to have uh, uh, very balanced distribution. So if the, the crisis is local, this is not going to hit us too hard. We always have to watch out how many cars we produce. We have to watch uh, the order bank, as I uh, said before, because the order bank is uh, something which is telling you how much people are willing to, 
to buy a car like ours, and if you have a solid order bank, which is tested over the weeks and over the months, usually you sh should not have uh, bad surprises. But you always have to be prepared to cut production and to have, uh, let's say, a close eye on uh, the different markets. Okay, so why don't you tell me about some of those different markets then? I've been asking our guests this week and, and many times about China, because for everyone it has been the big growth market, and now it's going through this sort of controlled slide. But you know, if we speak about mainland China, then uh, for Lamborghini and for the super sports car business in general, it's always been a very small segment. And uh, the segment is not uh, growing, it's shrinking since at least three or four years. So we are very well prepared also in the year 2016, uh, facing a stable, very small super sports car segment. Because you, you should uh, not mix the global market of China with the segment. And the segment is very small. In comparison, the US uh, segment of the super sports car is six uh, times uh, bigger and the total market is more or less the same. So you get a, an understanding and a feeling on how we look into the market, which is uh, very much different to uh, the mainstream cars. Okay. Let's talk about you, Mr. Winkelmann, uh, because as I understand it, you're moving on from Lamborghini shortly. Uh, what do you think will be the sort of legacy that you might leave behind after you know, 10 or 11 years there? You, you, you know, a legacy is something others should talk about and not the one uh, involved. But uh, I'm proud of the team, and if the team is recognized as the, the maker of the success of these uh, uh, cars and uh, the, the increase of the image of our brand, then this would be a legacy which is nice to be part of. Do you think, though, there'll be more changes at Lamborghini, if you can answer a uh, <laughs> thinly veiled question like that? I don't know, but this is, in, in a company there are constantly changes and if the head is changing there's a bit more visibility, but we are a company which has uh, 1,300 employees and we are hiring on a speed of uh, more or less 100 and more than 100 per year, so there are changes uh, constantly. Stefan Winkelmann, the CEO of Lamborghini, pleasure talking to you, thanks for joining us. Finally this week, we're off to Cuba, where providing medical services to foreign countries is a big moneymaker. But now the island's looking to its northern neighbour in the next step of what it's calling a health tourism industry. Natasha Ghanem has our report from a hospital in Havana. Riding a horse is strengthening the muscles in Miguel's back. The Venezuelan boy has cerebral palsy, and he's getting long-term treatment at this Havana hospital. <sighs> Two strokes brought Franklin Kwabu here all the way from Ghana. He says in almost three months, he's made great strides regaining his mobility. So far, he's paid $10,000 for day in and day out, physical speech and occupational therapy. We found that Cuba had the best value for money. The little that they have, they have maximized the usage. La Pradera sits on 17 sleepy hectares. The staff likes to think of it as a hospital and a hotel. In its almost 20 years of operation, 52,000 people have come here to heal, primarily from Canada, China, and Europe. People aren't coming here for state-of-the-art treatment. The U.S. imposed embargo on Cuba has made it difficult for hospitals to obtain certain types of equipment and medicine. And the government says it's hurt its ability to market, specifically to the United States. El área de la piscina. There's a but with ties slowly expanding between the two countries, the Cuban government has reason to feel optimistic. With this very important market, which is the American one, we could design a series of medical programs for them. We came across this group of Americans touring the hospital. I just wanted to know about it and, and to see what was being done in Cuba for myself and, and to understand it um, rather than making assumptions about it. Whether there's an untapped American market remains to be seen. In the meantime, people such as Miguel and Franklin may be the best advertisement for Cuba's medical tourism industry. The hope is both will soon walk out of La Pradera on their own.
And that is our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us. You can tweet me at KamalAJE. Do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email, which is at countingthecost at aljazeera.net. That is it, though, for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria, and the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.